Well, good afternoon, everyone. In March, the USS Annapolis submarine visited Australia. Today, we're very pleased to welcome our Aussie friends to Annapolis, to our colleagues, to our partners, to our friends, Prime Minister Wong, Deputy Prime Minister Mao, Penny, Richard. Uh, thank you for an incredibly productive day. Uh, we're so grateful not only to have you here, but to have had uh, a really terrific session, the 34th Austin that's been held between our countries. And of course, um, I'm particularly grateful to my friend and partner, Secretary Austin, uh, also to our hosts here, including uh, Vice Admiral Davis, and the Naval Academy for the incredible hospitality today. Uh, if um, you'll forgive me before getting into what we uh, discussed in, in Austin, I do want to say a few words about the Middle East. We continue to work intensely to de-escalate tensions in the Middle East and to prevent the spread of conflict. Uh, over the past few days, we've been in constant contact with partners in the region and well beyond. In those conversations, we've heard a clear consensus. No one should escalate this conflict. Uh, we've been engaged in intense diplomacy with allies and partners, uh, communicating that message directly to Iran. We communicated that message directly to Israel. Our commitment to Israel's security is ironclad. We will continue to defend Israel against attacks from terrorist groups or their sponsors, just as we'll continue to defend our troops. But everyone in the region should understand that further attacks only perpetuate conflict, instability, insecurity for everyone. And further attacks only raise the risk of dangerous outcomes that no one can predict and no one can fully control. It's urgent that everyone in the region take stock of the situation, understand the risk of miscalculation, and make decisions that will calm tensions, not exacerbate them. That's particularly true given the decisive moment that we're at in the ceasefire negotiations in Gaza. Uh, President Biden spoke today to President al-Sisi of Egypt and to Amir Tamim uh, of Qatar. These are the two countries that, along with the United States, are mediating negotiations to reach a ceasefire, to get the release of hostages. As the leaders discussed, the negotiations have now reached a final stage, and they agreed on the urgency of bringing this process to closure, concluding that agreement, and avoiding any action that could somehow disrupt it is the only path to ending the conflict in Gaza and bringing calm to the region. It's critical that all parties work to finalize an agreement as soon as possible. Now, from day one of this administration, we have been laser focused on realizing a shared vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific. I just got back from my 18th trip to the region uh, in, this, in this job. Uh, a big part of that trip was with Secretary Austin. Uh, we did two plus twos with uh, the Philippines and with Japan. Um, I was at ASEAN with Foreign Minister Wong. We were together also for the Quad meetings in Japan. At the heart of our work in the Indo-Pacific is our alliance with Australia. Today, yet another step forward in deepening, strengthening that alliance. President Biden has called it an anchor for peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific and around the world. It's enduring more than 70 years and our countries working together have made our people a little bit more free, more secure, more prosperous. But just over the past three and a half years, I believe we've made the relationship stronger than it's ever been. We've enhanced our defense cooperation, including expanded marine rotations through Darwin. We created AUKUS with the UK to bolster regional and global security, to turbocharge our defense industrial bases. We have the first cohort of Australian workers who just arrived in Pearl Harbor for training and maintenance on nuclear-powered submarines. And we continue to broaden the scope of our partnership, from collaboration on advanced AI and quantum to combating disinformation. When Prime Minister Albanese and uh, President Biden were last together, they talked about and agreed on plans to really advance what we call an innovation alliance. They inaugurated this during the state visit in October, and they continue, and we continue, to elevate science, technology, and clean energy collaboration 
as a fundamental part of the work that we're doing together. Through our Critical Minerals Task Force, we're strengthening supply chains for components that are essential to electric vehicles, to batteries, to solar panels, many of the things that will be at the heart of the 21st century economy, and they're also critical to combating climate change. Over the past just two and a half years, the U.S. has invested more than $5 billion in Australia for critical minerals. Yesterday, we also announced a partnership using satellite imagery to better manage natural resources and to help us tackle climate change. Throughout Austin, we also discussed threats to our shared vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific, a region that's stable, that's peaceful, that's prosperous, where sovereignty and international law are respected, where human rights are promoted and protected. We agreed on the importance of maintaining peace and stability in the South China Seas, the East China Seas, and countering any attempts at coercion. We're united on the need to maintain peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and to resist any actions that escalate tensions or undermine the status quo. We're also committed to deepening, strengthening the architecture that upholds this shared vision for the region and working more and more with other allies, with other partners, to advance the shared vision that we have. Uh, we've been enhancing our cooperation with Pacific Island countries. We're taking, of course, the next steps on AUKUS. We're advancing an affirmative agenda for the Quad, where Penny and I were just uh, engaged a few days ago. We reaffirmed the importance also of bridging the Indo-Pacific and the transatlantic uh, theaters. Um, very grateful that Australia is the largest non-NATO military contributor to Ukraine, providing air defense capabilities to helping train Ukrainian personnel in the United Kingdom. Fundamentally, we agree with Prime Minister Albanese that, as he put it, ours is an alliance with a bright future because it's an alliance for a better future. Uh, Lloyd and I are both incredibly grateful to Penny and Richard for their partnership and for their friendship. Penny. Thank you very much. Uh, can I first thank Secretary Blinken, uh, Tony, and Secretary Austin Floyd for hosting uh, Richard and I uh, at this remarkable facility on these beautiful grounds, and we really appreciate the opportunity to be here. If I may first start uh, with a, uh, just to, uh, to reiterate uh, and articulate Australia's support for what Secretary Blinken just said in relation to the Middle East. We, uh, uh, again, uh, endorse what he has said, urging all to de-escalate. De uh, and like him, Australia also underlines the risks to all in the region of escalation and of miscalculation. Uh, uh, Secretary Blinken said this is a decisive moment in terms of ceasefire, and we continue to add our voice uh, to the support for the ceasefire uh, outlined by President Biden and endorsed by the Security Council. Uh, this is uh, our third Osmin together, uh, and uh, they have all been uh, uh, really uh, warm, open, uh, trusting engagements, and this one particularly so. It's been an opportunity uh, in this meeting to continue strengthening our alliance, deepening our alliance, because what we want is an alliance that is always fit for the strategic circumstances that we face, which, as you all know, are increasingly complex and increasingly challenging. So I thank all of my colleagues for the transparent, constructive discussion we have had on so many substantial issues uh, and the quality of that discussion. Uh, as Secretary Blinken's uh, comments demonstrate and as the joint statement makes clear, we have covered a lot of ground. Uh, foremost in our discussion is how we work together uh, to assure the character of the Indo-Pacific, uh, an Indo-Pacific that is peaceful, open and prosperous, uh, and working together on what that requires from all of us, to step up our delivery in the region, to step up our collaboration with others in the region, to work across shared priorities, as we have been over these last years, on everything from infrastructure to sustainable development, to cyberspace to, and connectivity, to health and, of course, on security and conflict prevention. Each of us is combining all our elements of national power 
towards maintaining peace and deterring conflict. And together we work to ensure that no state ever concludes that the benefits of conflict in our region outweighs the costs. Uh, you would also have seen, uh, as uh, Secretary Blinken has said, we have made uh, a range of other announcements which demonstrate the continuing broadening of our partnership. Uh, yesterday, he and I endorsed uh, the US framework to counter foreign state information manipulation. This is about an investment in the protection of democracy. One of the many things we share and of course the establishment of the Australia-US Landsat Next Partnership, which enhances cooperation on satellite imaging data collection. Uh, and of course our entry into the global entry, US Global Entry Program from next year. But I, I, the, really the primary point I wanted to emphasize in this conference was this. American leadership matters. American leadership has always mattered and it remains vital today. It's vital for peace, for prosperity, in a free and open world. So we acknowledge and thank the United States of America for that leadership. We acknowledge and thank the US for the priority you place on allies and partners. Together we can do more, so much more in the world. And in today's discussions, we have seen what we share. We have seen the depth of our alignment. We have seen the depth of our strategic trust. And we have also seen the sincerity of our friendship. And I thank you for that. So thank you, Tony, and thank you, Lloyd. It's a privilege to work with you. Mm -hmm. uh, Deputy Prime Minister Marles, Foreign Minister Wong, it's great to have you here with us in Annapolis. But before I talk about our progress today, I wanted to say just a few words about the tensions in the Middle East. The Department of Defense continues to take steps to lower temperatures in the region and to ward off regional escalation by Iran and its partners and proxies. Several US service members were wounded yesterday in a rocket attack on Al-Assad Al -Assad Air Base in Western Iraq. So make no mistake, the United States will not tolerate attacks on our personnel in the region. We've adjusted our military posture to strengthen our force protection and to reinforce our ironclad commitment to the defense of Israel and to remain prepared to respond to any contingency. To maintain our carrier strike group presence in the Middle East, I've ordered ordered the USS Abraham Lincoln to replace the USS Theodore Roosevelt later this month. I've also ordered more cruisers and destroyers capable of ballistic missile defense to the region. And I've ordered the deployment of another fighter squadron to the Middle East to reinforce our defensive air support capabilities there. And these posture adjustments add to our already broad range of capabilities in the region. And we remain ready to deploy on short notice to meet evolving threats to our security, our partners, or our interests. The United States remains intensely focused on de-escalating tensions in the region. And we're also focused on securing a ceasefire as a part of a hostage deal to bring all of the hostages home and to end the war in Gaza. Now, let me turn to our two plus two. Today's meetings have once again demonstrated the extraordinary strength of our unbreakable alliance with Australia. The United States and Australia share a common vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific. And that guided today's discussions. Let me mention three key items. First, we agreed to continue deepening our force posture cooperation. Our countries are upgrading critical air bases in Western Australia and the Northern Territory. We're operating from new locations such as RAAF Learmonth 
and we're establishing an enduring logistics location at Band Bandiana. We're also increasing the presence of rotational U.S. forces in Australia. And all this will mean more maritime patrol aircraft and reconnaissance aircraft operating from bases across northern Australia. It will also mean more frequent rotational bomber deployments. Second, we're doubling down on our defense industrial base cooperation, and this includes supporting Australia's guided weapons and explosive ordnance enterprise. By the end of the year, we're aiming to sign two memorandums of, me memorandums of understanding on critical munitions. The first supports manufacturing guided multiple launch rocket systems, or GIMLERS, in Australia by 2025. The second advances the co-production, co-sustainment, and co-development of the Precision Strike uh, Missile, or PRISM. And as we accelerate our work together on PRISM, we agreed to stand up a joint program office in early 2025. Together, these efforts will help ensure that we have the capability and the capacity that we'll need for decades to come. And finally, we'll continue to advance our defense ties with regional allies and partners especially India, Japan, and the Philippines. And along with our UK allies, we continue to make outstanding progress through the AUKUS partnership. The United States is pursuing different initiatives with each of our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific. And all of, that work, all of that vital work builds greater peace, stability, and deterrence across the region. You know, Secretary Blinken and I returned from the Indo-Pacific just last week. We participated in two plus two meetings with our counterparts in Japan and the Philippines in both Tokyo and Manila. We spoke at length about Australia's vital role on, in our network of alliances. And the United States, Australia, and our other friends in the region are operating together more closely and more capably than ever before. So Richard and Penny, thanks for your leadership and for your commitment to our alliance and to the security in the region. So we got a lot done today. We'll keep building on our joint achievements over the past three and a half years, and we'll keep charting an ambitious course forward. Thanks again. And now, Richard, over to you. Well, can I thank uh, Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin for hosting Penny and I uh, at this year's Osmin, and it has been a real treat to be able to conduct Osmin this year uh, at the US Naval Academy here at Annapolis. This is the 34th Osmin, and it's the third that we've undertaken as a group of four. And when we reflect over the last two years, there have been huge achievements across three Osmins in advancing our alliance. We have seen today uh, groundbreaking discussions in respect of a much greater collaboration between our defence industry bases, particularly in respect of the manufacture of guided weapons uh, in Australia. As uh, Lloyd said, we have committed to having an MOU by the end of this year for the co-assembly of GIMLAS, guided land-based rockets, in Australia, uh, with the intent of the beginnings of that manufacturing occurring next year. We've also agreed to pursue a memorandum of understanding in relation to the co-production of the precision strike missile in Australia, with the standing up of a joint program office next year. Now, uh, what this has seen uh, is a much closer working of our defence industry bases and the legislation that was passed through the Congress last year with the complementary legislation that was passed through the Australian Parliament in March of this year has given rise to a generational dream in establishing a seamless defence industrial base between Australia and America. And we continued in our discussions today to develop this. 
This is going to give enormous opportunities for Australian companies to uh, participate and contribute to the supply chain here in the United States. And as part of this, uh, we're seeing a much greater cooperation between our two defence innovation systems. And again, we have undertaken to establish a MOU of cooperation between the Defence Innovation Unit here in the United States and the Advanced Strategic Capabilities Accelerator in Australia. In relation to force posture, this year's Osmin has built on the last two in seeing a deepening of American force posture in Australia. Now, the heart of that is the marine rotation in Darwin, which is occurring as we speak. And in the next couple of years, we look forward to the establishment of the submarine, submarine rotational force west in Perth. But American force posture now in Australia uh, involves every domain, land, sea, air, cyber and space. And so we are seeing uh, US Army watercraft, for example, engaging in Australia. And as Lloyd said, we've now seen a logistics base be established by the United States at Bandiana near Albury, and this is greatly going to enhance the United States' ability to operate in Australia. The presence of American force posture in our nation provides an enormous opportunity to work with our neighbours in the region. And as Penny and I uh, move throughout the region and speak to our neighbours, there is genuine appreciation for the contribution that America is making to the stability and the peace of the Indo-Pacific region by its presence in Australia. But what this is doing is allowing us to do a much greater range of activities uh, and operations and exercises with our partners, and we spoke about that today, with Japan, for example, where we've committed to doing a much greater amount of trilateral exercises between uh, our three countries, but also doing more maritime domain awareness work, uh, not only with Japan, but with the Philippines and with India. Finally, can I just uh, add my thanks to Lloyd um, and Tony for their cooperation with Penny and I in advancing our alliance. We deeply appreciate it. We deeply appreciate the personal role that Lloyd and Tony have played in giving expression to American leadership in the world, which, as Penny said, deeply matters. Deeply matters in terms of promoting democratic values and human rights throughout the world. Deeply matters in terms of maintaining a global rules-based order, which is so important for Australia, which engages Australia's national interest deeply. And so I really want to say thank you for the partnership that we have been able to express on behalf of our nations, but at a personal level, uh, I really want to say on behalf of Penny and I, thank you uh, for the deep friendship that we have now built across this stage. Thank you. Thank you all. Our first question will go to Sean Tandon, Agency France Press. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Secretary, Secretary Blinken, if I could start uh, to follow up on some of your comments on the Middle East. Uh, you mentioned that it's a decisive moment right now for the ceasefire talks. Uh, today, Hamas has appointed uh, Sinwar as their new political head. Um, somebody who masterminded the October 7th attacks, uh, somebody who, by most accounts, is hiding in tunnels. How does this bode for, uh, for ceasefire talks? Uh, you also mentioned um, the, the consensus uh, about, uh, about uh, how Iran should or should not respond. Uh, you spoke with the Jordanian foreign minister today. Do you think Jordan and other countries uh, in the region are on board in potentially uh, uh, repelling or, or, uh, or striking down any uh, Iranian projectiles uh, that, that may come? Um, and if I can ask all of us, all of you, uh, including our Australian, uh, the, uh, the Australian ministers, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, a very different appointment uh, today, uh, Mohammed Yunus in Bangladesh. Uh, I just wanted to see if you had any thoughts about where Bangladesh is going, stability, uh, whether you, how you see that. Um, and just very briefly, uh, Secretary Austin, if I could ask in particular, uh, on uh, but an important topic, a domestic one, but the 9-11 trial, okay. um, the, the plea agreement, which, which, which you have cancelled. I wanted to see if you could explain that a bit to us. Um, there, of course, 
of course been concerns about the plea agreement voiced by some of the families, um, but also there have been longstanding <coughs> concerns about a trial, not only because of the death penalty, but because of the use of, of, of waterboarding, of torture in the, uh, in, in the evidence. Do you believe a trial can go forward? Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Sean, and um, I know your colleagues appreciate you asking their questions yeah. for them as well. <laughs> um, so on the questions uh, addressed to me, first with regard to um, uh, Mr. Sinwar, um, he has been uh, and remains the primary decider when it comes to concluding uh, a ceasefire. And so I think this only underscores the uh, fact that uh, it is really on him uh, to decide whether to move forward with a ceasefire that manifestly uh, will uh, help so many Palestinians in desperate need, women, children, men, who are caught in a crossfire of Hamas's making in Gaza, uh, whether we can put um, Gaza and the region more broadly onto a more peaceful and, uh, and secure path. Uh, so uh, it only emphasizes the fact that, as has been the case for, for some time, it really uh, is on him. And as the uh, President said today, following his conversations with uh, President al-Sisi and with um, uh, Amir Tamim, uh, this is the moment. This is the decisive moment. Um, the negotiations have reached their final stage. And we believe um, strongly that they should come across the finish line very, very soon. And that, besides uh, changing everything, for people in Gaza, bringing the hostages home, giving us an opportunity to build a more enduring uh, peace for, for Gaza, also opens up uh, other possibilities, other prospects more broadly uh, in terms of uh, de-escalating tensions and bringing uh, real security and stability. Um, that's what we're focused on. And so when it comes to defending Israel, we are resolute, uh, will remain resolute in making sure that we do everything possible to defend it against uh, any attacks. Uh, I'm not going to speculate on how that uh, might go forward. Um, I can tell you that the intense focus that we have and that all our partners in the region have, including our Jordanian partners with whom I spoke today, uh, that focus is on de-escalation, is on making sure that no one takes any steps that could actually um, add fuel to the fire uh, and broaden the conflict. And they're also intensely focused <coughs> on getting the ceasefire over the finish line. Uh, with regard to Bangladesh, we're monitoring the situation very closely. Um, I would just say that any uh, decisions that the interim government makes uh, need to respect democratic principles, need to uphold the, the rule of law, need to reflect the will of the people. Um, we, for our part, take very seriously the uh, safety and security and well-being of American citizens, of our personnel. Uh, we, uh, we went, as I think you know, to order departure of our non-essential personnel. And of course, we'll be watching this um, day in, uh, day out. Uh, you asked me a question on Bangladesh, uh, and I think the Secretary's outlined uh, really a, a, a similar position to the one I would have articulated. I, I, I was in Bangladesh not long ago, so I obviously have watched with particular personal concern, uh, as well as our uh, nation's concern about the violence and tragic loss of life in Bangladesh, and I want to offer our deepest condolences to families and friends of all those uh, who have died. Uh, in relation to the interim government, what we would do, say is we, we call on all parties to cease violence, we call on all parties to de-escalate and respect universal rights, and we urge a full and independent and impartial investigation into the events of recent weeks. Uh, we continue to support uh, the calls from the people of Bangladesh for an orderly and peaceful return to a democratic and inclusive government. Yeah, he okay. thinks he I probably thought, had I you thought quite Richard was gonna... <laughs> Well, thanks for the question. I would just say that there's not a day that goes by when I don't think of 9-11 and the Americans that were murdered that day. Also, those who died trying to save lives and the troops and their families who gave so much for this country in the, in the years following that. I'm deeply mindful of uh, my duty to all those whose lives were lost or changed forever on 9-11. And I fully understand that no measure of justice can ever make up for their loss. 
So this wasn't a, a decision that I took lightly. But I have long believed that the families of the victims, our service members, and the American public deserve the opportunity to see mi military commissions tri commission trials uh, carried out in this case. And I'll leave it at that. Okay. Our next question will go to Jade McMillan, Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Thank you very much. Uh, Secretary Blinken, Julian Assange's lawyers say that they'll be seeking a pardon for his criminal conviction in the US. Would you consider that to be appropriate? And secondly, were there any concerns raised on the US side about how the Australian government responded to his release? There was some uh, criticism domestically, for example, that the welcome uh, he received risked damaging the relationship between Australia and the US. Thank you. Look, uh, we've uh, had a legal process uh, go forward uh, and conclude. Um, we didn't talk about this at all today. It didn't come up in our, in our conversations. And in terms of what follows, um, I would refer you to our own Department of Justice. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's a legal process. It's been concluded. And I'll leave it at that. Okay, our next question will go to Reuters, Idris. I've got a few questions as well, so let's drop in. Um, well, can I just ask um, Minister Wong and, and Deputy Prime Minister Marles, um, what role would Australia play in a Taiwan contingency beyond basing support? Um, would you commit troops to helping defend Taiwan? Um, for Secretary Austin, who was behind the attack at al-Assad yesterday, and do you believe an Iranian or Hezbollah attack against Israel is imminent? Um, Secretary Blinken, um, why do you believe Prime Minister Netanyahu will um, heed your calls to de-escalate given that for the past nine months or so he's either ignored or gone directly against your requests, um, whether it's on civilian casualties or um, uh, you know, negotiations on the ceasefire? And, and more broadly, you mentioned the, the, the ceasefire talks are in their final stages. We've heard similar optimism before. Um, why, or do you believe that Israel has set back that effort, given that they allegedly killed the leader of the group that they were supposed to be negotiating with? Do you want to? Well, let, perhaps if I uh, start and I'll uh, hand over to, to Penny. I mean, the first point to make in respect of your first question is obviously we're not going to speculate uh, about hypotheticals uh, in the future. Um, our alliance uh, is one where we are working closely together with the United States to deter conflict uh, in the future. And that is where our focus uh, and energy is at. And in that respect, um, our position remains one of supporting uh, the status quo across the Taiwan Straits and not want wanting to see uh, any unilateral change to that status quo. Uh, thanks, Idris. In, in terms of who was behind the attack uh, on al-Assad, um, we're sure that it was uh, an Iranian-backed Shia militia group. Uh, specifically, which group? We're still investigating to, uh, to, determine, uh, to determine that. In terms of whether or not uh, or when uh, Iran would uh, choose to attack Israel, I'm not going to speculate on any uh, any Iranian actions going forward. Idris, as you know, what I've been focused on is making sure that uh, we're doing everything we can to put measures in place to protect our troops and also make sure that uh, we're in a good position to uh, aid uh, in the, uh, in the uh, defense of Israel if, uh, if called upon to do that. Um, so you've seen us do a number of things to strengthen our force posture uh, and uh, again, I'm in constant uh, communications with, with my commanders in the region and also uh, with our allies as well. So uh, we'll see how this evolves, but I won't, I won't speculate on any specific action by Iran or any other uh, Iranian-backed uh, backed group uh, going forward. And Idris, uh, with uh, regard to the Middle East, uh, it is manifestly in the interests of everyone involved uh, to avoid escalation, to avoid the conflict spreading. And I believe that actually no one wants 
escalation. No one wants to see the conflict spread. But it's very important that um, no one takes steps that could lead to that, even if it's unintended. And that's why we've been engaged in this intense effort across the region and beyond uh, to press everyone involved, including Israel, to avoid anything that could uh, actually escalate the conflict. And uh, again, it comes down to the fact that people, that's not where people want to go. We want to make uh, sure to the best of our ability that they don't go there even um, by inadvertently. Uh, when it comes to the ceasefire, let's understand uh, where we are, how we got there, and why we believe this is something that should close and should close very soon. Um, some weeks ago now, President Biden put before the world a proposal for the ceasefire, the release of hostages, a pathway to an enduring peace in, uh, in Gaza. And the entire world rallied behind it. Country after country stood up in support of the proposal, culminated in a vote at the United Nations Security Council, 14 to nothing, uh, endorsing the proposal, indeed incorporating it into a resolution. We don't see the Security Council agreeing on much these days, uh, but I think that reflects the fact that quite literally the entire world um, came out in support of it. Um, and then it took some time, but Hamas, after a couple of weeks, uh, agreed to support the proposal. So there's agreement on the, uh, on the framework. What we've been working on for the last few weeks are important details of how that is actually implemented. Uh, and there were some things that had to be negotiated in that process. That work has continued even with the recent events um, in the region. And we believe, based on the work that's been done, based on the very practical issues that are at stake, that there is no reason that this should not be uh, concluded and concluded quickly. So this is really a time for all of the parties involved to close this out, no delays, no excuses, no reasons why we can't do something, focus on getting to yes. The reason, among other things, that we very much want to avoid any escalation is because, yes, that has the potential to disrupt concluding the ceasefire agreement. Uh, so in and of itself, escalation would be a bad thing, uh, but it also has the potential to um, upend bringing the ceasefire over the line and bring it to conclusion. Again, this ceasefire is profoundly in the interest of everyone. It's in the interest of Israelis. It's in the interest, of course, of the hostages, uh, their families uh, around the world, including in the United States. It's manifestly in the interests of the Palestinian children, women, and men who are suffering every day. It's in the interests of virtually every country in the region uh, because not only is what's happening in Gaza at stake, but many of these other points of conflict will also be profoundly affected by uh, getting a ceasefire. It opens up the prospect of calming things down everywhere in the region. So that's our focus. Um, we're doing everything we can both to avoid the escalation bring the ceasefire agreement to, to conclusion, and we won't stop until we get there. Our final question will go to Adam Creighton, the Australian. Uh, thank you very much for taking our questions. Uh, this one is for Secretary Austin. Uh, so recently, uh, the influential uh, media magnate Rupert Murdoch uh, said that in his view, uh, he did not think uh, the US would come to the aid of Taiwan if, if China tried to encroach on the island. Um, so what do you make of that sort of assessment, and if, if Mr. Murdoch was wrong, uh, is it the expectation of the US uh, that Australia would come t to the assistance of the US militarily in any such confrontation? Well, I, I certainly want to comment on uh, Mr. Murdoch's analysis or, or his statement. Uh, and I won't speculate on whether or not uh, uh, there will be a conflict. As, as uh, I've said a number of times, I don't think conflict uh, with China is is either uh, imminent or inevitable. Uh, you know, we continue to work with like-minded partners in the region uh, to ensure that uh, we're doing things to um, promote a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, and so the things that, the types of things that you've seen us do over the last three and a half years, I think, have been quite remarkable. Above and beyond the things that, uh, that we discussed today, uh, in this two plus two, uh, which, I mean, that's, there are substantial accomplishments uh, but, that our two countries have uh, accomplished together. Uh, but if you look at the things that we've done in terms of strengthening our relationship with India, uh, developing um, 
helping the Philippines to modernize their, their military, uh, you know, bringing uh, Japan and, uh, and the ROK closer together, uh, and seen us do recent, uh, a recent ministerial in, uh, uh, in Japan with a Japanese Minister of Defense and, uh, and the Minister of Defense from ROK. That's the first time that that's ever happened. Uh, and so there's just so many things like that that, that we have done uh, in the region to, uh, to work with others to ensure that uh, we do, in fact, uh, move things towards greater stability and security uh, and promote that vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. So again, I won't speculate on, uh, on anyone's comments or, or whether or not there, there will be a conflict. I will just tell you that uh, you know, we'll continue to do what to, to work with our, our allies and partners to, to, to make sure that uh, we're moving things in the right direction, and that direction is towards greater stability and security. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our press briefing. Thank you very much for joining us today.